Okay. Well, we're one week into 2024. How are we doing on those resolutions, those commitments, those goals? I hope you're doing well. I'm all into goals, commitments, resolutions. But sometimes we just think by flipping the calendar that things will magically change. I don't know about you, but today seems awful lot like 2023 still. So just by magically turning that thing, we just don't change. But maybe, just maybe, we need to be rescued from ourselves. Pastor Scott's been talking about rescue stories, and today we're gonna talk about one of the greatest, if not the greatest rescue story ever recorded in scripture. And that's what we wanna talk about this morning. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. I know 2 Chronicles isn't your normal stomping ground. If you need help getting there, it's right after 1 Chronicles. Back in the spring of 1994, there was a pastor in Wisconsin that got a call. And he got a call from a warden from a prison. And he said, the warden said, hey, I got a prisoner here. He wants to be baptized. And he's like, okay. Pastor's done it before. But the warden said, you know, I think there's something you need to know before you come. And the pastor goes, yeah, what what would that be? And he said, the prisoner's name is Jeffrey Dahmer. I don't know about you, but growing up in the 80s, that name just sends chills down my spinal cord. Jeffrey Dahmer admitted to killing at least 17 young men. The things he did with those bodies afterwards, we can't mention in church. They're so satanic. So the pastor went talked to Jeffrey Dahmer, believed he had a true conversion story, and he baptized him. This sent shock waves amongst the evangelical community. Could someone who's done such rotten, evil things on this earth, could we possibly share heaven with someone who was so hellish on earth? If that story in any way makes you squirmish, The story we're going to talk about to you is really going to offend you today. 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Manasseh's father was Hezekiah, who was very godly. Only David was more godly as a king than Hezekiah. If you don't remember the story of Hezekiah, Hezekiah... Um, was godly, as I already mentioned. But Hezekiah is going to be approached by the prophet Isaiah, the same Isaiah who wrote the book of Isaiah. And he says, your days have been numbered, set everything in line, you're about to die. And Hezekiah cried out to God and pleaded to God for more life. And Isaiah comes back to him and says, God's heard your cries, he's heard your prayers. You got 15 more years. Many theologians believe that Hezekiah cried out to God to live longer because he had no male heir to take his place. It was during those 15 years that Manasseh will be born. So Manasseh was born into a spiritual oasis, but chose to walk away from it. His 55 years as king was the longest reign of all the kings of Judah. Manasseh was not ignorant about God or understanding the right way to live. In fact, as I mentioned before, Isaiah the prophet was often in his dad's court. Verse 2, he, meaning Manasseh, did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord disposed before the sons of Israel. He chose to do evil. People who do evil always choose to do evil. They just don't wake up and are evil. They choose it. Tradition even says that Manasseh had Isaiah the prophet sawed in half in a hollow log. He imitated not his father Hezekiah nor David, but he imitated the nations who did evil that Israel had conquered prior to this. 
Why did he choose to go that direction? No one really knows. But my guess, he was, he was persuaded by someone in the king's court that was worldly and not godly. Remember the Disney movie Aladdin? The king was good, but Jafar, he was evil, and he influenced people. All it takes is one evil person to influence someone down the wrong path. The apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Studies, in fact, show that people who grow up in the church and fall away from the church as adults, the thing that influences them the most is witnessing in the home. Is it real or is it not real? If it's only a one day a week thing that they go to church on Sundays, there's more chance that they'll fall away. If it's more of a Sunday to Saturday type of witness and testimony, there's more likely that they will stay in the church. Let's go to verse three. For he, meaning Manasseh, rebuilt the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. He also erected altars for the Baals and made ashram and worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He brought Judah back into terrible idolatry as he imitated Ahab as bringing back Baal worship. If you don't remember the story of Ahab, King Ahab, he's the one that the prophet Elijah will go mano mano on and they'll go up on top of the mountain and they'll say, today is it gonna be Yahweh or Baal that we worship? Who's the real God? And of course, Yahweh will win that hands down. When it says high places, these are hills and were places of pagan worship. Baal were gods of people in the ancient Near East that they worshiped. Asherah was basically on a pole that they worshiped and she was the goddess of fertility which was worshiped through ritual prostitution. When it says that he worshiped all the hosts of heaven, these are idols to the moon, the stars, the planets. These are all astronomical gods. Basically, anything he could make into a god, he made into a god. Verse four, he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, my name shall be in Jerusalem forever. I mean, he actually placed idols and built altars in God's house and the temple that Solomon built. It'd be like coming into our sanctuary here and putting some type of satanic altar here. That's what he had the nerve to do. Verse five, for he built altars for the host of the heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He actually had a cultic worship of astronomy in Solomon's temple. Basically, he was doing anything and everything just to stick it to God. To say, I don't know you. To say, I don't believe in you, God. I mean, this was one bad, evil dude. But we're just getting warmed up. Verse six. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. And he practiced witchcraft, used divination, practiced sorcery, and dealt with mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. The first thing, understand that God, and it says this over and over, is slow to anger. Look at all that Manasseh had to do to provoke God to anger. The valley is known as the Valley of Fire. It was a deep, narrow ravine on the southern side of Jerusalem. It was filled with pagan altars. They took their children there as a human sacrifice and would throw a child into the fire. It was the way you could most express your devotion to a pagan god was to offer up your child and the altar. We view this as horrific and disgusting, as amoral as we should. But honestly, is it really that much different than what we are doing today with abortion. We have ultrasounds that see the baby being formed. We have sonograms to hear a baby's heartbeat. And yet in America alone, since 1973, we've had nearly 70 million abortions. Our current governor of the state of Illinois has gone out of his way to proclaim our great state of Illinois as a safe haven 
for abortion and said, and I quote, abortion will always be safe and legal here in Illinois. Illinois is and will remain a beacon of hope in an increasingly dark world. If I may editorialize for a second, that's disgusting. I mean, for him to say that in order for us to have light in the world, we have to have abortion free and legal up until the time of the birth of the child. He just doesn't get it. If you think abortion is a political issue, then you've been deceived by the world. Abortion is not a political issue. It is a biblical issue. Psalm 139 says, for you have formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, in 2 Kings, it says this about Manasseh. It says that he filled the streets of Jerusalem with innocent blood from border to border. This is supposed to be the leader of the people. The rest of the verse in verse six talks about his practice of witchcraft, which is seeking to control others through communication with evil spirits. Divination, which is seeking to interpret the future by omens. Sorcery, which is seeking to gain power from evil spirits. And the mediums and spiritists, which are diviners who could seek to consult the dead. He more than just dabbled in the world of the occult and the spirit world. He believed he could become religious or great by doing these things. Verses seven and eight. Then he put the carved image of the idol which he made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever, and I will not again remove the foot of Israel from the land which I have appointed for your fathers, if only they will observe to do all that I have commanded them according to all the law, the statutes, and ordinances given through Moses. This shows how depraved Manasseh was by putting a carved image into God's sanctuary. He gave an idol, the place God alone deserved. He showed no respect for God. But if we're really honest, aren't there times we do that? Are there times we come to church with our own idols, with all things that we place before God? We come to church on Sunday. We come to worship God. All God says is, give me your best. How many times do we come into church? And I'm, I sit here right in front, and I'm as guilty as anyone. And we don't give God our very best. That's what God wants. That's all he wants. Verse 9. Thus Manasseh misled Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. It wasn't bad enough that he did these awful things himself, but he led his entire people this direction. Second Kings tells us what the attitude of the people was. It says, they paid no attention. They were seduced. In fact, they wanted more evil. They were enjoying their sin. What verse nine tells me is that leadership matters. The king seduced them. He said, this is the direction we wanna go. And they followed him. Leadership matters, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or Springfield, or at our county level, or at our local level, or at our school board level, or in our family. Leadership matters. And I understand this is an election year, and I have no idea who we're gonna vote for, whatever, I, whatever. But understand that leadership matters. That's all you have to understand. It mattered in biblical times, it matters today. Because we follow the leader. Verse 10, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. I mean, God actually spoke to them. He warned them. He did this because of his covenant love for his people. God knows the consequences. He's trying to help 
his people. So the question is, has God ever spoken to you? Has you ever been prodded by the Holy Spirit? Have you listened and obeyed? Or did you ignore his voice and suffer the consequences? I know in my life there's been times I've ignored the voice of God and suffered those awful consequences. Verse 11. Excuse me. Therefore, the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them. And they captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze chains and took him to Babylon. The consequence of his evil is Assyria invading the land of Judah and capturing Manasseh. If you've forgotten your world history, and shame on you if you have, Assyria, let me just give you a really brief description. Assyria was a very small nation as far as population, so they ruled through intimidation. And so what they would do is they'd go into a, a town, a village, and they'd just wipe it out. And they'd kill everybody there. And then they'd decapitate them, and they'd place the skulls in a pyramid really high. And then they'd go to the next city, and they'd say, if you don't want it to end up like that, you're going to do exactly what we tell you to do. If you remember the story of Jonah, he was ordered by God to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. There's a reason why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. The Assyrians were evil. But I mean, this is what Manasseh deserved, right? He got what he deserved. And right now you should be saying, yes, this is what consequences do. The hook in the nose wasn't figurative. This is literal. It was a common torture tactic used by the Assyrians. They treated him simply as a wild bull. Verse 12. When he was in distress, he entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. I don't know about anyone else in here, but I'm more than just a little insulted when it says his God. I mean, Manasseh's done everything possible to stick it to God, to say, I don't like you, I don't love you, I'm doing everything possible to be away from you. But now that he's desperate, he calls out to God. It's been said that God speaks to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us in our pains. Manasseh was in pain. He's completely humiliated, dethroned. He really got what was coming to him. He got what he deserved. The essence of his sin was pride. Pride means I am God. I will decide who God is. I will decide what right and wrong is. But verse 12, it throws a major curveball into us. It's most unexpected. But in reality, God had Manasseh right where he wants him, in a complete position of repentance. The key phrase in this verse is he humbled himself. The idea is that he understood who God was. So let's understand some definitions here. Sin, the word sin means miss the mark. So I'm playing darts and I throw the dart at the dartboard and I miss the dartboard. That's the idea of sin, I miss the mark. I know the mark, I know where I'm supposed to go, but I don't hit that, that's sin. Confess means I agree. So if I confess my sins, I agree with God that I missed the mark. I agree with God that I have sinned. Repentance, on the other hand, means I was going this direction. I was going in my own direction. And now, I'm gonna go 180 degrees and go a different direction. Now I'm gonna go in God's direction. I understand that the direction I was going was the wrong direction. Now I'm gonna go in the right direction. But the other part of repentance is I'm not gonna do it again. I understand that what I was doing, the direction I was going was so wrong, now I'm gonna go the different direction in God's direction. Repentance is more than just simply saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry does not move the heart of God. True repentance moves the heart of God. 
Let's finish with verse 13. When he, Manasseh, prayed to him, God, God was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew the Lord was God. I've always wanted to know the words Manasseh used when he prayed to God. I mean, the Old Testament is littered with all kinds of prayers that people prayed. And the reason why they're written in there the way they are is that people prayed, God answered. God answered because people prayed. It gives us an example. But in this case, his words are not recorded. But it wasn't his words that moved God. It was his heart. Manasseh had a complete heart transplant. The phrase, he was moved, meaning God was moved. In the Hebrew, it means that God was filled with emotion. God is moved when we repent. When we go his direction and not the direction of the world. We don't play games with God. If you want God's attention, you must humble yourself and repent. Most theologians believe this is the greatest conversion story in all of Scripture, with the possible exception of the Apostle Paul. It's completely amazing to me that our prayers can move the heart of an almighty, sovereign, all-knowing God. But they do. So where do we go from here? How do we wrap it up? Well, we started today by saying just flipping the calendar doesn't automatically change things. Just like showing up for church each Sunday doesn't automatically change things. Each person needs his or her own rescue story. The story we looked at today is as radical a rescue story as ever recorded. You may not be as evil as Manasseh, but you still may be going down the wrong path. Just flipping the calendar won't change anything. What will change your direction is getting right with God, humbling yourself, repent, go a different direction. Ask yourself this question, is my way really working? If the answer is no, then I would suggest going God's direction. Manasseh did. Manasseh was forgiven for all he did. I mean, think of all the love and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that God had for Manasseh. God didn't use it all up on Manasseh. He has plenty left for you too. Let's pray.